Hello, welcome to Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard. And today we are, if you have abandonment issues or trauma, healing from grief or loss, you're really going to want to tune in and keep it locked on 101.9 because today we're going to be speaking with Susan Anderson. She is the author of Taming Your Outer Child, Overcoming Self-Sabotage and Healing from Abandonment. And Susan Anderson is a psychotherapist. She's founder of the Abandonment Recovery Movement and has 30 years experience working with the victims of trauma, grief, and loss. And she's also the author of The Journey from Abandonment to Healing. And she offers workshops throughout the world. She lives in Huntington, New York, and she's going to be visiting California and Oregon coming up pretty soon. So if you're anywhere near there, um, pay attention to what she has to say. If you want to meet with her, welcome to the show, Susan. I'm happy to be here, Marie. Thank you so much. So first of all, maybe you can tell me a little bit about uh, what inspired you to write this book. Well, I was working with the victims of abandonment trauma, um, and I was doing that because I had my own adult abandonment experience. Um, here I was, an expert in abandonment for all those years, 20, 20 years working as a therapist, specializing in looking at things through the lens of abandonment, so to speak. And I, my own marital partner of uh, 18 years, just suddenly up and left me for another woman. Oh, my gosh. I threw myself into the task of saving myself by discovering more effective tools than the ones that I had already been using for my clients. And so I was working with these new tools that I spent years researching, of course, and working with the trauma, with the trauma victims of abandonment, other trauma victims like myself had been, and I needed a tool to help people overcome the self-sabotage that is the aftermath of abandonment. And it was interesting because many people came in to the workshops and to, into, into all the different recovery programs that I had, not because they had a current heartbreak. Some of them, many of them did, of course, but some of them came because they had childhood issues of abandonment that were causing them to sabotage their adult lives, sabotage their relationships or their goals. And so I needed a, a new tool to really help work on self-sabotage. It seemed to be the most important event on everyone's mind. And so out of that came the sort of the counterpart of the inner child. If you think of the inner child as the part that's been wounded by abandonment and that feels the hurt and the fear and the insecurity, you can think of the outer child as the part that acts that out in a way that sabotages our relationships and our goals. And so that's how outer child was born, so to speak. So, Susan, it's interesting how people with abandonment issues, like you said, they, they tend to self-sabotage. But why would we do that, especially if we don't have anyone taking care of us? We really need to take care of ourselves. Well, when we feel rejected or when a relationship ends or if we're being fired from a job or a friend doesn't call us back or we don't get invited to a party and we get these abandonment feelings triggered very easily by just large events and small events in life, what we tend to do is have self-doubt. We tend to wish that we were... Um, more lovable, that we were more attachment worthy, that we were more popular, that we made a better impression. Let's say we fail to get an, a promotion at work. And so we, get, we begin to doubt ourselves and we get angry with ourselves. And that leads to self-abandonment. As we begin to question ourselves and doubt ourselves, we move further away from ourselves and we create within this sort of abandoned inner child. And that inner child is just under the surface, sort of bubbling up air and affecting our lives in a very intrusive way because it's just sort of under the surface. We're not all that conscious of it. But over life, we've tended to, you know, be, accumulate a lot of self-doubt. And so this abandoned inner child begins to act begins to create feelings that then we act out in inappropriate ways. So it's the self-sabotage that stems from self-abandonment that stems from going through various abandonment scenarios from childhood on. 
Now, Susan, pretty much every human being has felt abandoned or rejected at one point. So what's the difference between someone who has a regular level of abandonment and someone who has abandonment issues and self-sabotages? Yeah, that's a really good question because the fact is that we that abandonment, the issue having abandonment fear is universal to all people. So we all have it to some extent. And what's truly ironic is that some people who've never had any abandonment issues that they were conscious of before can have a full blown reaction in adulthood when there's a rejection or a breakup or something of that sort. So the answer is that even people with ideal childhoods and wonderful parents and coming from families that were loving can have very strong reactions. So part of the answer is that it's universal to all people. But if we did have difficult childhoods, let's say our parents were alcoholic, that would give us sort of a chronic you know, abandonment scenario where our parents aren't emotionally available to us when we need them. Um, we tend to have a rougher time in adulthood. But as I said, that's not always true. Some people are very resilient, and other people with perfect childhoods can have um, a a very big reaction to an abandonment situation. The same is true for self-sabotage. People who have difficult childhoods, who have a lot of sort of chronic abandonment situations, one of their parents died or their parents were too punitive or too critical or, as I said, alcoholic or something like that, can have a lot of abandonment issues and a lot of self-abandonment leading to self-sabotage. But all of us self-sabotage to some extent. There's not a person alive who could possibly say that they don't have self-sabotage going on at some point. Everyone um, procrastinates about something or may avoid a task that's unpleasant, unpleasant instead of taking care of it. So these things tend to be across the board. We can all benefit from uh, overcoming the, the self-sabotage. We can all benefit by healing the abandonment. Awesome. Well, and it sounds like you talk about uh, the, the outer child. So this is the, the inner child are, are your feelings, and that takes place in the amygdala. We might not even be conscious of it, right? Yes, your inner child just refers to everything that you're feeling and all of your needs, and some of them may be conscious and some of it may be unconscious. And by unconscious, you know, it it means that it can be triggered so that it might not be something you might not be feeling hypersensitive. You're with a friend who's very supportive, but all of a sudden that friend dismisses something that you've said and kind of criticizes or judges what you've just explained, and out can come a very strong reaction, anger or hurt, because the feeling was unconscious. You weren't in touch with feeling hypersensitive, but there was an undercurrent that got triggered by what this friend said. Hmm. It's it's interesting. You, you also mention in the book, Susan, that if we take time as we'll use relationships as an example because that's pretty universal um but people will feel abandonment in relationships and then they'll take a long break from it thinking that they need time to heal and then they go back into a relationship and in that time span their fears under the surface have actually grown yes because it it turns out that uh, fear incubates instead of dissipates over time and this is something that has been demonstrated in, in laboratory experiments with, with animals of, of other species, um, that in the absence of taking care of an issue while we avoid it, the fear that we're avoiding tends to get worse. So what happens is we go through a breakup, and of course, you know, at first we're gun-shy because it's so painful, and we're afraid to get hurt again. And we hear all of this advice from many people, therapists, friends, who say you must wait until you're completely healed before you start a new relationship. So we wait and we wait and we wait, but we still have fear and apprehension, and we still pine a little bit for the other person. And so we keep waiting, and what we discover is the longer we wait after a certain period, the more resistant and afraid we get. 
So then when we try to get into another relationship, much to our surprise, we're having all of this insecurity and overreaction, and we feel, oh, I didn't wait long enough. You know, I, I should have, I'm not ready for a relationship. And our friends and therapists may even tell us that, well, you're not ready, you're overreacting. The truth is, maybe we waited even a little too long because we allowed the fear to incubate and we, we allowed some of the fears and the feelings to fester because we didn't have a working laboratory, you know, a new relationship to kind of work them out with. Hmm. But you're, it doesn't sound like you're condoning the rebound, like break up with someone and then two days later you have a new partner. No, I, <laughs> I don't condone someone rushing out to replace a partner because there is a, a natural grief process. And it's very important to go through the grief process and to really get in touch with all the feelings and work them through. But it is well, the part that I try to emphasize is that life itself is therapy. Life itself is recovery and a great place to begin to work on all of those feelings that are bound to come up. Uh, you've been hurt once, you're afraid it'll happen again, so there will be some more fear and anxiety when you approach a new relationship. Um, but to work on it while opening up and reaching out to new people. And while being out there in the world, actually living your life um, and working through your fears rather than avoiding life and avoiding your fears. Hmm. There's uh, another really important point that you make in the book that really resonated with me, and that's the issue of addiction to abandonment. Well, there's a condition that I call abandonalism, which is the addiction to abandonment, which is you are attracted only to unavailable people. And this is so prevalent that there are so many people who are attracted to the unavailable. And it even reaches the extreme that when somebody comes along who initially was unavailable, and then they become available, they, you know, they, they decide, okay, you know what, I, I'm here for you, I... I'm opening my heart up. Let's be together. And that, at that point, when you're a bandaholic, you tend to lose interest. And you say, well, you know, this person has become boring, or uh, I don't think there's no chemistry, or, you know, he or she just isn't the right person. And what really happened there is that the person became completely available and you lost interest because unbeknownst to you, you've become you know, sort of addicted, so to speak, to the insecurity. You've become addicted to the hard-to-get feeling of pursuit. And by addiction, I mean it's something you've become um, accustomed to in a way that in order for you to feel that you're interested in someone, in order to feel, quote-unquote, love towards someone or attraction, you need to feel simultaneously insecure. Hmm. Well, that's a bummer. It's a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually just went through um, a, another breakup recently. I noticed, uh, and, and you also talk about this in the book, that people who tend to distance themselves and have fear of, I believe the word is engulfment, are really just the other side of the same coin of fear of abandonment. Yes. How, um, how does that people work? People tend to swing on a pendulum between fear of abandonment and fear of engulfment. Now, there are some people, and I'm sure you've seen this out in the dating world, who tend more toward the fear of engulfment. As soon as somebody becomes too close to them, they feel the walls closing in, and they lose interest, and they want out. The people who have that kind of reaction very often are highly el eligible people who others want, and they seem to have be pursued by others because, of course, they're hard to get because the minute you try to hold on to them like a bar of soap, they're slippery and they just pop out of your hand mm -hmm. and so they become the desired object, okay? So there are people who tend more toward fear of engulfment where they can't stand somebody counting on them and needing them and falling in love with them and, you know, the wall, it makes the walls close in. The opposite of that is fear of, an, of annihilation, fear of abandonment, where you're constantly afraid of being rejected. You're afraid yet another relationship is going to fall apart because the other person lost interest. But what's really uh, um, ironic or almost hilarious 
is that many people have both. So they have a fear of abandonment when they like the person and the person is a little hard to get. But then they have fear of engulfment the minute the other person likes them. Mm. And I'm using the word like instead of love or attraction because at the beginning we like someone. We like them instead of not like them. You know, we like them. That's how it starts. And when we like someone, when we actually, hmm, I like him or her, that is when we want the person, and that is often when we fear the abandonment because what if they don't like us back? So the, this pendulum can swing between fear of abandonment and then fear of engulfment, back and forth in a wild pattern that doesn't leave very much time in between where you're having an actual relationship which is in balance because the pendulum swings to the opposite extremes. That seems to be sort of what happened with this most recent situation. Like I met him and I liked him. And then I saw that he seemed to have this distant personality type. And right away I was like, oh, no, I can't let myself like this person because I can see already what he's going to do to me. So then I tried to push him away. And what that did is it made him want me more. And then he pursued me. And I kind of gave in because the chemistry was so strong. And then we just got into this, yeah, this pendulum where it was just drama every few days, which every time we went through that cycle, it would both bond us more and make us more fearful. Yeah. And it was just a disaster. Yeah. How Um, do you stop that? This can happen so easily to so many people. They ricochet back and forth. So you, you saw abandonment coming down the pike so you decided to short circuit and drop out and then that made him pursue you (laughs) and back and forth and it's a ricochet effect and it's of course it's very painful because you know what it does it creates in that couple a seesaw up and down back and forth pattern which is painful and therefore the relationship can be you can get stuck in something like that especially if it goes back and forth and it's not one side wanting the other side more consistently, if it's sort of you take turns, that can be a very stuck pattern that it goes back and forth. It was interesting because we had, um, we went through this pattern a couple of times and I was trying to explain to him, like, look, I can see where this is going. And he was saying, well, you're not giving me a chance. And I kept defending my position. And then as soon as he started to be on board with, yeah, it's a good idea that we end it, I felt myself coming on to his side where maybe we should try again. And so then we completely switched. It, it was just, but this is, this is the, the cycle, and it, and it is a, a, an addictive cycle. It's very addictive, and it even involves, it's addictive not just psychologically, but it involves the body's opiates. You know, we we produce our own opiate-like substances. Well, they're they're opioids, they're called, and they're the endorphins and other encephalins and various opiates. And when we're going through the upheaval in a relationship like that, we have attachment and then separation, attachment, separation. The opiates in the body are produced, and we actually become addicted to the cycle. So it isn't just psychologically. We're actually looking looking to regain our homeostasis by staying in a painful cycle. Oh, it's so brutal. <laughs> but, and I imagine, brutal. I imagine that um, because what I'm noticing is now it's been, it's been a few days and um, I start to feel a bit calmer. And then if we have any contact again, like I can just feel it. It's like... It's like having a cigarette after you've quit smoking. Yes. It's, um, it's toxic. You can, when you, after you've quit smoking, you can actually feel almost you know, sick from smoking the cigarette but excited at the same time. It's sort of like, ah, oh, yes, it's the, it's the sort of toxic flavor that I love. <laughs> so it's that contact becomes so so significant and it is that that makes it just like an addiction because look what happens to the alcoholic um, when they have been 
you know, in recovery for a while, and then they have a slip, and they have alcohol. Oh, it is the most incredible slip because it leads to such an extraordinary feeling of of drunkenness and and over over indulgence because the alcoholism has exaggerated the effect of the alcohol by quitting. Mm. Well, this is a pretty complicated issue. We're going to talk some more about it after the break. Right now, we are speaking with Susan Anderson. She is a psychotherapist and the author of Taming Your Outer Child, Overcoming Self-Sabotage and Healing from Abandonment. We'll be back with more Synchronicity in a moment. Welcome back to Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard, and right now we are speaking with psychotherapist Susan Anderson. She is the author of Taming Your Outer Child, Overcoming Self-Sabotage and Healing from Abandonment. Welcome back to the show, Susan. Good to be back. Thank you. So we were talking about that addictive cycle of the abandonment and engulfment pendulum swinging back and forth, this drama and the dopamine and the endorphins. How do you break that cycle? Well, I know it's a very, very tough cycle because it plagues people all over the all over the world. It's probably the number one pattern that I see out there. But it is breakable. It involves making a mind heart connection in a very specific way because what this is, it's an outer child behavior. It is taking a feeling that you that you a set of feelings, but we'll just say a feeling that you possess within you and it is acting it out inappropriately so that you are taking a need and an, an emotional set of feelings and you are creating an addictive pattern with it and the solution is to begin to deal directly with that inner self that is beholding that feeling through a, through an exercise program that makes that possible and you you give self-loving actions and gestures to that innermost part of yourself, and you make an internal connection so that instead of being caught up in these patterns that don't help you get where you're going, you actually begin to find healthy relationships. Mm. Now, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about what the outer child does because in this example of my own personal experience, we had just had this big conversation about how much we trigger each other and how we were going to cope with it. So we had a game plan and it happened again. And over the course of a few hours, I went from, okay, I'm not going to act on this to something in me started to justify why I needed to have this big reaction and break up with them by email rather than just staying calm and talking about it the next day. So why is it that we have these behaviors that we can't seem to stop? It's almost like a compulsion when our intellect is telling us this is not the right decision, but we we convince ourselves that we should still do it anyway. Okay, well, um, you, you have to sort of use your imagination here to imagine that within you, and of course this is true for your viewers, that you, you're just you're expressing a very, very prevalent pattern that so many hundreds of thousands of millions of people have. But within you is an abandoned inner child. And what you're doing there is your abandoned inner child um, needs to feel love, and it is placing this need on a person outside of yourself. And the person that really needs to give this inner child love is yourself. But instead of giving that love and that nurturance and and administering directly to yourself, you're laying those needs at somebody else's feet. So the outer child is looking to act out that need for love. And the only person who can sort of scratch the itch of the love is someone who's a little bit unavailable. So here you are needing something from this other person, something completely unrealistic that he can't give you that is beyond him because of where he's stuck in his life and what his issues are, etc. And then when you anticipate that he can't give that to you, you're going to have a big reaction and act it out breaking up with him as if it's all his responsibility and all you have to do is take a big axe and cut that off 
and that'll work. That'll make you feel peaceful. Of course, all of that is not going to do the job because you're actually looking for an external solution. You're making him sort of the external regulator, so to speak. Only he can make you feel better, and by breaking up with him, only that can make you feel better. But all of that is outer child. What, what the solution to this is is that your adult self first needs to adopt that abandoned inner child and really hear what she wants and needs. There is no specific person that she wants. She wants security and love and mutual love. And when you begin to realize what she wants and needs and that she most wants it from you, she wants you to need her and be as close to her as she is dependent on you, her adult self, to get her these things. So the two of you need to form a very close relationship. And this doesn't happen, of course, as you know, by osmosis. It happens through an exercise, a hand, hands-on exercise program that actually allows you to administer to yourself so that you're not always laying your needs at somebody else's feet and creating drama. Now, you're not saying that a person should stay in a relationship where they're being neglected or mistreated, but you're saying it, that you're getting your validation shouldn't only come from an external source. You should be doing that for yourself. Yeah, you're bringing up a very, very important point because it requires uh, really understanding what your needs are so that you can actually be more comfortable with wherever the other person is. For instance, you would not stay in a relationship that was neglectful, but when you learn how to complete your own loop more emotionally and you can make yourself feel secure and you can give yourself love and you can give yourself esteem and you can give yourself assurance, etc., which we it sounds easier said than done. I mean, this is done through an exercise, of course. Um, but when you're in that position, it allows us to coexist with someone who may not be able to give us those things, you know, 24-7, who may have their own issues. So it takes a lot of knowing who you are and what you want to be able to say, look, is this, I'm using your example of your relationship, but it probably doesn't really fit um, your situation. I'm just using, using this to illustrate the point. Is this guy really not responding to me? Is he really not uh, caring and not capable of caring? Or is it that I have had unrealistic expectations of him? And if he really doesn't have the capacity to be in a relationship, then am I just trying to beat up a, someone and turn them in? Am I trying to get blood out of a turnip? Am I just using him as a, as a prop, as a tool, to try to turn him into what I need? Or do I need to give up and actually spend some time with myself and then go out and look for someone who's really capable of these things? Mm. Well, that's another thing that the outer child does is they'll cling on to a distraction. Like, I already know in advance this is not going to be a healthy relationship, yet I go into it anyway. The outer child is always looking for the external solution. The outer child is always looking for the prop. So what happens is, like, even if it's an employment situation, we turn our job into a stage, and the people we work with become props. They become actors on our stage, and they enact our drama for us. You know, we organize people to, to belittle us or, or to all different ways that we have, that we turn our, our life situations into a stage, and then we enact our own drama on it, and we keep recreating our patterns. But where the place that this happens the most is in our relationships. So that's what we tend to do. We use our relationships to act out our dramas. And so we pick people who aren't available because then they can play the part of our little little play that we've written in childhood, and they keep helping us to recreate it. This is all very outer child. Outer child is looking to another person as a prop, as an actor on our stage. The healthy thing, what happens is when when there's a real good mind-heart connection 
and the adult self and the inner child are closer and working together is they're not looking for a prop. They're not looking for an actor to reenact an old drama. They're looking for now when they when they've had a period of getting to know, you know, getting that strengthening that internal bond, they're looking for someone who actually can care about another person, be consistent toward another person, be loving toward another person. And so we're actually looking for that type of person and not trying to turn someone else into um, sort of a a prop or an actor on our stage. Mm. Well, we are speaking right now about abandonment issues, loss, grief, and taming your outer child. We're speaking with the author of the book, Susan Anderson, Taming Your Outer Child, Overcoming Self-Sabotage and Healing from Abandonment. Now, you have a series of exercises throughout the book. Um, Can you talk a little bit about these writing exercises and why they're so important? Well, um, writing is a way that involves the most part of parts of the brain all at once. You, when you write, let's say, about your feelings, you're using your cognitive brain and you're using your emotional brain. You're bringing different parts of your brain together in an integrated task. So writing is a very effective um, healing tool. Um, there's also the use of your imagination involved. In writing, you have to sort of conjure up images of uh, an outer child and an inner child and an adult self. You're creating those images using your imagination. And then you're having them, you know, play out certain parts in, in, the, in the writing exercise. So you're using your imagination also. You're really exercising your brain. And it's very strenuous physical exercise for the brain. It's physical therapy for the brain. And it incrementally strengthens that adult muscle that allows you to to reach your higher self and really take yourself in hand and begin to change these these patterns. Um, but the writing exercises are one component. The com- first component of the program is u- the use of your imagination, using your mind, the part of your mind that can envision itself a little bit in the future, like a year or two or six months or a few months in the future, as if you've already begun to achieve all of your goals. You're imagining what could be, and you're using your imagination in a very powerful way to visualize a future that contains some of your goals met. You're also using your imagination to um, to create these three parts of the personality, inner child, outer child, and adult. And your mind gets a very strong workout from this. It's very good physical therapy for the brain. And then the written exercises, and this is followed by the third part, which are action steps, which involve taking positive, self-loving actions every day. So it's a three-prong approach, which involves imagination, uh, written exercises, which is connecting feelings, and taking action. So, Susan, I'm curious now, are you intentionally each day doing this little written dialogue or do you wait until there's a trigger? How how do you practice this most effectively? The use of your imagination, since it is nearly effortless and you can do it while you're driving in the car and you can do it while you're standing online at the bank, you can have your eyes open, but you just need to take a moment to use your imagination This is something you do every day, no less than three times a day. And I recommend doing it for three months. You'll see results pretty quick, but three months, it it has a powerful impact. The written exercises involve sitting down and doing something, maybe 10 or or 15 minutes at the most, um, but it's still sitting down and doing it. So I recommend using this exercise when something triggers you during the day. For instance, you've committed another act of self-sabotage. You've given up and you've called him again and started things all over again, or um, you've had a strong reaction to his not answering your last text, or you know, you've had a setback, even if it's small. But that's a great excuse to do the written exercise. So people tend to do that a couple of times a week, given people's schedules. And then taking a daily action step is very easy. 
you take tiny baby steps so you can incorporate one every single day. And they're so easy to do, you might incorporate two or three of them because all you do is weave them into what you're really, you know, your work day and your your regular day. So you're doing these things on a daily basis or with a written exercise every couple of days, and then you're doing them is for on an ongoing basis, and I would say a minimum of three months. So when you say the three times a day, that's the, the visualization practice that you yes. read about? Okay. And that's a minimum. It's so easy to do. You could do it 50 times a day easily. But three, you know, to, to remind yourself whenever you're in the car, do it again. Uh, if you haven't, if you're waiting for something, do it again. Use every every opportunity to to do it. I like to give people prompts. If you're doing something that's a bad habit, use the prompt instead of doing the bad habit. Use it to visualize. It's a great way to prompt yourself to do it. Um, but it's it's very easy. Hmm. Now, I was reading your book yesterday, and I was going through and and doing all the writing exercises, and. I found it really effective. Um, Then at night, I was lying in bed and I was feeling triggered. So I was, I didn't really want to get up and turn on the light or anything. So I was trying to talk to the inner child and the outer child and all of that. But I noticed that I, maybe I was too escalated to be able to focus on it. Is that part of what the writing does for you is to focus? The writing really helps when you're very emotionally uh, triggered and you're all charged up emotionally, sometimes just writing, the act of writing, starting the dialogue, having big you say to little you, I want you to tell me everything that you're feeling. And in your case, because you are you have been, I'm, again, I'm using you as an example. I may be exaggerating this tremendously, but um, just to make an illustration, um, in, in your case, it may be that you're... Uh, you're very charged up from going through this painful relationship. And um, your little you in that case would be very abandoned and feel very lonely because you're you're not taking care of little you. All of your eggs are resting in his basket and you're making him so important. And she, who you, you seem to be talking to, but she's not getting, she's not getting her thoughts across because she needs you to reassure her that you're not going anywhere, that you won't abandon her and you won't put her in harm's way and that you're responsible for what she's feeling, nobody else, and that you're there to do whatever you can do to get strength, to find any way that you can to give her reassurance so that she doesn't have to depend upon, you know, this guy or anybody else to give it to her, that she can get it directly from you. And she's feeling very worried that you're not going to do that. And she's feeling um, mistrustful. And, of course, that's the nature of this of little you. Is, that's how most little yous feel. And so your, your task when you're feeling at your worst, so much so you can barely focus, is to say, I, I don't have words to, to comfort you right at this moment, but I just want you to know, little, that I'm collecting your tears in a cup. I'm hearing you. I care about what you're feeling. I might not be strong right now to know what to say, but I'm going to get stronger and I'm going to find a way to help you. As you're, as you're sharing that, it, it uh, gives me the image of, I've heard from so many people uh, while they were growing up, if they had a parent who was in an abusive relationship or an addiction or something like that, which I guess an abusive relationship is a form of addiction, um, and that child gets completely abandoned because the partner or because the parent is so busy chasing yes. that external thing, they neg- neglect the child. It's the same thing as your inner child. Yes. The parent's primary relationship is with the alcohol or with the drug or with the gambling or whatever it may be, um, and not with the child. And the child feels that. And, of course, the child goes through terrible you know, there's, there's this helpless feeling because no matter how perfect they try to be or how cute or how they, they try to get good grades or they try to become the little parent and take care of their parents and take care of everything, no matter what the child tries to do, they can't seem to be special enough. They can't count enough. They're not enough, and they blame it on themselves to get their parents to give up the alcohol, let's say, and 
and become loving toward them. And so the child, you know, feels bad and, and unimportant and unspecial and unlovable. And that's, that's the pain of it, really. So as adults, we have that child within us, and we make ourselves feel that way by making the other people in our life count so much. It's very human and natural. We don't have to be crazy to make somebody outside of us terribly, terribly important. I mean, we're kind of built to do that. But when we do it, we make that inner child feel so neglected and so helpless and so unimportant. And so there's a huge amount we can do to fix that. Mm. Wow. Well, (laughs) it's time for another break. We are speaking with psychotherapist Susan Anderson. She is the author of Taming Your Outer Child, Overcoming Self-Sabotage and Healing from Abandonment. We'll be back with more synchronicity momentarily. Coming up in just a few minutes here on CITR is Parts Unknown with DJ Chris Arific. But right now we're speaking with Susan Anderson. She's the author of Taming Your Outer Child, Overcoming Self-Sabotage and Healing from Abandonment. Now, Susan, you're going to be going on tour, it sounds like? Uh, Yes. um, I'll be starting my workshop season very shortly on the East Coast as well as the West Coast. Because giving workshops, doing outer child recovery work in a group is very exciting because people inspire each other and they get to witness each other's incredible um, insights and also the, the, the victories that they make in terms of helping to turn things around. And if people want to get in touch with you, where's the best place to do that? They can learn about my workshops or get in touch with me through my website, which is, I have two um, abandonment.net, and then its sister site, outerchild.net. You know, they work hand in hand, the two websites. Mm. Thank you. So again, that's abandonment.net or outerchild.net. And Susan, we have just a few minutes left in the show. I'm wondering where you'd like to take the rest of this conversation. Well, one of the most important points that I loved getting across is the fact that when we change a behavior, we don't have to change it perfectly. Because, you know, let's say somebody's been caught in a pattern forever and they just haven't been able to fix it, they've tried everything. Well, they don't have to completely change the pattern. They don't have to completely get rid of it. They have to start to make a small dent in gaining more awareness and taking a few more positive actions. And shockingly, that's just enough, making a small change to make all the difference in the world. So the hope out there is get started with a recovery process because as you make little changes, bigger changes occur and it creates momentum. Now that's part of your daily action steps, right? Yes. that's Well, that's, that's part of all three prongs of the program because you start to put the prongs together and you do, let's say your problem is codependency and you're, let's make you very co- codependent, some people are. Um, And the next day or a few days later, you're still codependent, but maybe a little less so. Just enough less so that a relationship that hadn't been working starts to work. Or your your employers um, start to notice you a little bit more because you're showing more self, you know, in your position. You don't have to change completely. It's, It's the beginning of a change that makes just the difference that can make all the difference. Hmm. Thank you. And I wanted to ask you um, about blaming our outer child rather than blaming our feelings. And I kind of, as I started reading the book, I thought, I don't know if I like this blaming thing. <laughs> yes. Well, unconsciously, we, when we, before we had an outer child to attribute the um, acting out behavior to, we tended unconsciously to blame our inner child. We'd say, I love you, inner child, but I wish you weren't such a basket case and ruin all my relationships. I love you, inner child, but I wish you weren't so damn insecure where you may give me performance anxiety. And we tended to blame the behavioral part on the inner child. So with the outer child, we can attribute it to the outer child. But, you know, we don't really want to blame anything. So in the end, we attribute it to the outer child, and as we work this through, we begin to 
come to peace with the outer child, in fact, the adult self actually shoulders outer child, takes it under its wing, and guides the outer child so that all three parts are integrated and nothing is rejected. So it's almost like if you have a hyperactive kid that's always getting in trouble, if you take him and, and focus him on a task that makes him feel better about himself. Exactly. You're learning to manage something that really is simply a little rambunctious and, and acting out, and you actually come to peace with it and integrate it into the, into the personality, just like an, outer, just like an active child. Mm. So in your workshops, do you, are all your workshops live, or do you do any webinar-type work? I've done um, uh, Skype workshops, and I have not done a webinar, but I'm open to that. Um, I, my workshops that I was referring to before are live because the face-to-face -face contact is just absolutely amazing and, and the relationships that form. But in the um, Skype, relationships form also, and that's a very important component to be able to really see and feel each other, to understand we're not alone with these things. Mm. In, I'm curious, in the workshops, do you do other things, or is everything that's in your book kind of the same material that you work on? Well, we do many other things because it's a pretty comprehensive length of time. Um, at the, one, the workshop that I give in California, for instance, is six days, so it encompasses an awful lot of, of, of very good tools that are not, are not in the book, and some of them actually come up as a result of the composition of the group, who's in the group and what issues they bring up. So the workshop is pretty comprehensive. Six days? Yes. That's oh, a it's, lot. It's wonderful. Wow. Can you share a little bit about what happens in the workshops? Um, it's a, a workshop to heal abandonment and overcome uh, outer child patterns. And people um, are introduced to their own feelings. That Many of them come in in a tremendously difficult state of, you know, acute abandonment where they've just broken up with someone and it's just terribly painful. Others come in with more chronic type of issues, but we share those in a very constructive way. We do a lot of goal setting, and in that process, the, the quality of the sharing and the, the pe people are really sharing with each other in, in a way that they've never shared before on a level of depth, and it creates a tremendous trust factor in the group so that there is a, a great deal of sharing, but the group is very structured because it's really teaching tools and their take-home tools so that it's structured around teaching constructive, very safe self-help techniques and people practice them and share in this deep way. And by the end of the workshop, the sharing has been such that and watching each other practice the, the tools such that it is a real growth experience. Mm, thank you. And your website, again, is abandonment.net and outerchild.net. We've been speaking with Susan Anderson. She is the author of Taming Your Outer Child, Overcoming Self-Sabotage and Healing from Abandonment. And Susan, is there anything that you'd like to add before we wrap up the show today? Well, I'd like to suggest that one of the cornerstones of abandonment is the feeling of hopelessness. If you didn't feel hopeless, you wouldn't really be feeling abandoned because you'd be just feeling a temporary angst, but it's the hopelessness that kind of defines it. And yet there's, there's no real basis for hopelessness because no matter where a person is in their present life, no matter how stuck in a pattern or how stuck in heartache, it can improve, and it can improve to a level that it can actually make the difference in life. Mm, thank you. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you, Susan. And I really, really enjoyed your book. Everyone should get it. Um, well, anyone with abandonment issues, at least. <laughs> um, Taming Your Outer Child, Overcoming Self-Sabotage, and Healing from Abandonment. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Oh, thank, thank you for your time, too. Thank, thank you. you. Take care, Susan. Have a wonderful day. All right. Thank All right. you.
So this has been Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body, and soul. We were just speaking with Susan Anderson. And if you want more information about her book or her workshops, go to abandonment.net or outerchild.net. This has been Synchronicity. Thank you so much for listening and joining us today. I'm going to close the show with a song by the lovely Theta Phoenix. And uh, thank you so much again for being with me. I want to send you lots and lots of love. Chris Rific isn't in here yet, but he will be in a minute. Be well. Love you so much. Namaste.